everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker. Today we have episode 254 for January 10th, 2022. And we've got a news show for you today, a lot of stuff to cover. Not quite as many articles as I normally would try to fit in, but uh, some of these are longer and I wanted to talk about them a little bit more. Also, I wanted to save room for New Year's resolutions. And this is something I do every year around this time because yeah, it's New Year's. And what I like to do is kind of cover some ideas for things you might want to put on your to-do list for this year, things that you can do to improve your security and privacy in 2022. Now, I don't want to be repetitive. I mean, otherwise, every year this would basically boil down to the same top five or top ten list uh, that, that I would do every year. So uh, I'm trying to mix things up a little bit. And this year I'm actually going to talk about my personal resolutions for 2022, because even though I'm a security to privacy guy, uh, and I preach this stuff all the time. I'm not perfect. There's still things I need to get done too. And some of these things I think you're going to want to do yourself. So uh, I will walk you through some of the things I'm going to do. And of course, I will give you a couple other ideas, things you might want to put on your list. And we will make that a massive tip of the week after we cover the news. But first, I got to have a shout out to Betty White. Not only because she just recently died and not only because she was an absolutely amazing comedian with a wonderful career and I love all the characters she's played over the years, but, and I don't, I don't know if this was a coincidence or not, but I, on Twitter, I ran across of all things, Betty White doing a YouTube video about the benefits of multi-factor authentication. And it was just priceless. I would maybe play it for you here, but honestly, you need to see it. You need to watch her do her physical comedy that she does so well. And there's you know, some video editing that, you know, that kind of enhances all of that. So <laughs> I would just recommend that you go watch the YouTube video yourself. It's not very long. It is quite good, actually. And she, she makes great points in funny ways about the benefits of multi-factor authentication. <laughs> so anyway, of course, there's a link in the show notes. You can find it there. But if you, I'm sure if you just go to YouTube and search on Betty White and multi-factor authentication, it will come right up. So here's what we're going to talk about today. There was a, a last pass incident that actually turned out to be nothing, uh, but it raised a lot of eyebrows and myself included. I posted a couple things on Facebook and Twitter about it with proper caveats, I might add, uh, because in fact, it did turn out to be kind of nothing. But I think it's important to talk about anyway, because it probably did make the news a couple places. And um, so part of my commitment to you guys is that I don't want to overhype stuff. I don't want to, you know, get into hyperbole. You know, I'm not about, you know, lighting hair on fire and sh screaming that the sky is falling, unless it really is. But in this case, it, it, it's just kind of interesting uh, from that perspective, as well as what actually happened. So we'll talk about that. The Federal Trade Commission here in the United States, basically the government agencies in general under the Biden administration have really started to crack down on some bad practices. And they are actually coming out strong, urging companies to deal with this whole log for j debacle. And it's still ongoing. And this article actually kind of gives an update on where things stand with that too. So it's kind of a two birds with one stone article. So we're going to update you on what's going on with that massive log for J security vulnerability and tell you some of the things that our government here in the United States has tried to do about that. There's a little short little article from Texas about a QR code scam. I, it popped up on my radar and I thought it was interesting, especially since I just went on that rant a few weeks back about QR code articles, but this one actually has some valid points. And so, you know, I wanted to kind of circle back to that. If you haven't seen this in the news, it's really quite amazing. Norton LifeLock, I, I think is the company name now, maker of Norton 360, the antivirus software, has just put crypto miners into its antivirus software. Yeah, let that sink in just for just for a minute. Uh, well, we're going to talk about that and and actually some consolidation in the antivirus software market that I wasn't aware of until these articles came out. Because it turns out these guys actually own several software companies that make antivirus products that you might be curious to know. The other thing besides New Year's resolutions that starts coming into people's mind when we turn the corner into a new year is paying your taxes. In the United States, that would be in April of the year uh, following the tax year. And it turns out that Intuit, the biggest tax advice software maker on the planet, I believe, has opted out of the United States Federal Free File Program. And I've talked about this before, probably a year ago when taxes were an issue last year. But also when ProPublica did a very interesting expose on this whole free file program. In fact, we even had an interview with somebody from ProPublica on the show to talk about that back in the day. So here's the next twist in that story. And that is that Intuit's going to back out of that agreement with the federal government. 
So we'll talk about why that might be. And finally, I got a couple articles about Google. Uh, one that's kind of esoteric. It's kind of techy, but I'll explain it to you. And I think it's important for you to understand what's going on there. Uh, and it's yet another reason why you might not want to use Chrome, or in this case, any Chrome-based browser, which um, there are many. And then I'm going to talk about an interesting lawsuit that is claiming basically that Google and Apple are collaborating behind the scenes to interfere with competition in the search engine market, uh, which of course is dominated by Google, and what the implications of that might be. And then we'll wrap it up with multiple tips of the week, which will encompass my suggestions for you as some potential to-do list items for your cyber New Year's resolutions for 2022. And one more thing, uh, I'm conducting my annual listener survey. I really want to get your feedback, uh, and I'm going to incentivize you to do so. So be sure to stay tuned at the end of the show where I'll give you more information on that. So lots to talk about. Let's get to it. Okay, first up, this is an article from BGR, and it kind of talks about some stuff that went down right at the end of the year last year, right before New Year's. That looked like it could have been really bad. It was uh, what was kind of being dubbed a last pass breach of some sort, where people were getting notified that somebody was trying to log into their account uh, and wasn't successful. The automated message had said that LastPass had blocked the attempt, but that they had somehow used their correct master password, even though people were saying that their master passwords were basically unguessable. And in the end, it turned out that it was really just a whole lot of nothing. But uh, it raised a lot of eyebrows and made me tweet a few things and post a couple things on Facebook just in case these things were for real. Turns out that they weren't. But I still think it's important to talk about what happened and why you probably don't need to worry about it. All right, here's the article. LastPass is a password manager app, the kind of security application we always advise people to use to increase the safety of their passwords. These services can store all your passwords and help you choose unique passwords for each online account. All you need to remember is one strong password. This allows you to quickly sign into any online account whose credentials you've saved in your account. And that's kind of sounds funny, but they mean in your, in your vault, you know, in your password vault. If a password manager were to suffer a data breach, then an attacker could get access to all of the other passwords. That's the kind of scenario LastPass users have been afraid of since Tuesday afternoon when, when reports emerged indicating a potential data breach. And again, this would have been, this article was written on December 29th, so it would have been the Tuesday before the 29th. However, LastPass says it did not suffer a hack, and attackers do not have access to your master password or the passwords in your account. It all started with a post on the Hacker News. A user said that LastPass blocked a login attempt from Brazil. According to a LastPass email, the hackers used the LastPass account's master password. And then this is a quote from the person who posted that. It said, quote, What troubles me is that the master password was stored in a local encrypted X file. I can imagine that someone has my X file and the completely different password to this file. If that's the case, I'm in a world of hurt, unquote. Anyway, going back to the article, it says, LastPass later confirmed the attempted account breach, so the email the victim received was not a phishing attack. Moreover, other forum users experienced the same kind of attack. This prompted worries that LastPass suffered a hack that might have exposed user accounts. Such a data breach would indeed be a nightmare scenario for anyone using password managers to secure their online accounts. However, that's not what happened according to the company. In comments to Gizmodo and Apple Insider, LastPass denies a hack. Instead, the company says the attackers attempting to breach accounts are using username and password combinations from other data breaches. And here's a quote from that statement. It said, LastPass investigated recent reports of blocked login attempts, and we believe the activity is related to attempted credential stuffing activity, in which a malicious or bad actor attempts to access user accounts, in this case LastPass, using email addresses and passwords obtained from third-party breaches related to other unaffiliated services. And that's the end of their statement. Then I'm going to be going back and forth between statements from LastPass here and quoting from the article, so forgive me, it's going to be a little disjoint. Furthermore, LastPass said that it hadn't seen any evidence of actual hacking. Attackers did not hack LastPass user accounts, the company explained. And then again, a quote from LastPass, they say, It's important to note that at this time, we do not have any indication that accounts were successfully accessed or that the LastPass service was otherwise compromised by an unauthorized party. We regularly monitor for this type of activity and will continue to take steps designed to ensure that LastPass, its users, and their data remain protected and secure. 
And then the article says, in comments to The Verge, LastPass explained that some of the alerts were errors due to an issue that it has resolved. And again, from LastPass, they say, our investigation has since found that some of these security alerts, which were sent to a limited subset of LastPass users, were likely triggered in error. As a result, we have adjusted our security alert systems and this issue has since been resolved. These alerts were triggered due to LastPass's ongoing efforts to defend its customers from bad actors and credential stuffing attempts. And then back to the article, furthermore, LastPass also says that the app doesn't store the user's master password. As a result, a LastPass hack would not lead to attackers gaining access to master passwords. And one last quote here from LastPass, they say, It is also important to reiterate that LastPass's zero-knowledge security model means that at no time does LastPass store, have knowledge of, or have access to a user's master passwords. And then wrapping up the article, they say, That's all good news. But LastPass users who might have received warnings about potential third-party account access attempts might still be worried. If you received one of these LastPass emails, you should consider changing your master password. You'll also want to check your sensitive accounts that you store in LastPass for unauthorized activity. It's also a good idea to change passwords for those services from time to time. Also, you should consider adding two-factor authentication to LastPass and other sensitive accounts. If nothing can put your mind at ease, you can consider migrating your passwords to competing services. One password is one such alternative, but there are other password managers to choose from. Okay, so my take on all this. First of all, LastPass was doing all the right things here. They were over-communicating about everything that was going on as it was happening, responding immediately to these uh, few users who were having problems. And by the way, as far as I can tell, this is literally like maybe a couple dozen people worldwide um, that were having this issue. So it was very small, but it was taking place on a very well-respected uh, security forum called Hacker News, which I've actually quoted articles from several times here on the show. And this was a discussion forum where people were posting about, hey, this is going on. Is anybody else seeing this problem? And a few other people said, yeah, I am too. And what it sounds like happened is that basically LastPass has some sort of a automatic alert system to email their users when there's suspicious activity. And these emails were either triggered in error and or the message in those alerts was confusing or incorrect. At the end of the day, when the dust settles, basically nobody's accounts were hacked. And it sounds like there was really no damage here whatsoever. And it even sounds like according to LastPass that, that the, there really wasn't, uh, there really wasn't a login attempt that correctly used somebody's master password because all these people in this hacker forum, as you might expect on a hacker forum, were saying, Hey, I, I don't reuse my passwords anywhere. And this password that I was using was super, super secure, like, you know, big, nasty, random stuff that nobody could have possibly guessed. So, I mean, they were starting to speculate now, you know, if they were infected with a key logger, you know, if they had actually, if their computers had been hacked, in which case the bad guys might have seen them type in their master password and then reused it. So lots of speculation, all fueled by these apparently erroneous alert emails. So anyway, at the end of the day, it looks like actually nothing happened here. And all of this basically helped us to confirm what we already knew. And that is that LastPass is secure. LastPass does not cannot access your master passwords. All of your data is stored on their systems, fully encrypted by your master password. It never leaves your device before it's been encrypted by that master password. And then as far as we know, LastPass is secure and did not have a problem. Now, some of the advice given here at the end, I might quibble with a little bit. First of all, I think the first thing you should do is set up two-factor authentication. If you have not set up two-factor authentication on LastPass, you absolutely need to do that now. Like, Maybe even pause the, pause this podcast and go do it. That is an absolute must for something as crucially important as your password vault. Because had there been some sort of a screw up on LastPass's end, where I mean they don't store your master passwords, but let's say somehow a bad guy figured out a way to bypass the master password entry as you know as the mechanism for getting to your vault, which should mean that they would then hit your second level defense the two-factor authentication. But if you don't have that second level of defense in place, if you don't have what we call defense in depth, then you would potentially be compromised. So you definitely, definitely need to have two layers of defense here, a really strong, unique master password and multi-factor authentication. And like the article says, I would also be setting up multi-factor authentication on any other accounts you have that are critical, financial, medical, social media, email, 
all of those should be protected by two-factor where you can. Now, should you change your master password? Uh, you know, if it makes you feel better, go ahead. But I mean, from everything I've heard from this article, that's not an issue here. And by the way, it recommends that you could go to other services, but but other services are just as vulnerable, really. Honestly, I you know, LastPass, OnePassword, Bitwarden, uh, maybe Dashlane. You know, these are all top names in password manager software applications. I am sure that they are all bending over backwards to be as secure as possible. Doesn't mean that any one of them can't make a mistake. But I will say that Bitwarden is open source. So at the very least, we can hope that Bitwarden's code has been reviewed by independent third parties, which is always a good idea. Grading your own homework is never a good idea. But that said, as we're about to see when we talk about Log4j, even open source doesn't guarantee that something's going to be secure. All right, so let's, speaking of which, let's move on to that story. So we talked about Log4j a couple of weeks ago and it hit the fan, <laughs> but it is it is really bad. And there's nothing that has happened in the ensuing couple of weeks that has changed that opinion. In fact, if anything else, it's gotten worse because they've actually found more bugs in Log4j. Not as bad as the first one, but basically <laughs> once the eye of Sauron, once the big spotlight hit Log4j, it was being picked apart looking for any bugs. And of course, when you get that level of scrutiny, you're going to find more bugs, which have been fixed to Apache's credit, the, the organization that kind of owns it, even though it's open source. Anyway, this article is a little bit long. It's from Threat Post, and it starts by talking about the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC here in the United States, and what they're doing to try to encourage uh, companies to get in line and get this stuff fixed because it really is a big problem. Uh, but then it also kind of goes on to talk about you know, what's happened in the last couple of weeks uh, with Log4j and, and give you an update there too. So it's kind of a two for one. So anyway, let me read this article from Threat Post. The Federal Trade Commission will muster its legal muscle to pursue companies and vendors that fail to protect consumer data from the risks of the Log4j vulnerabilities, it warned on Tuesday. And this was written uh, January 5th. And this is a quote from uh, the FTC's posting that says, the FTC intends to use its full legal authority to pursue companies that fail to take reasonable steps to protect consumer data from exposure as a result of Log4j or similar known vulnerabilities in the future, unquote. Those companies that bungle consumer data, leaving vulnerabilities unpatched and thus opening the door to exploits and the resulting possible, quote, loss or breach of personal information, financial loss, and other irreversible harms, unquote, are risking consequences tied to weighty laws that have resulted in fat fines, the FTC said. It mentioned, among others, the Federal Trade Commission Act and the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act. The FTC Act, the commission's primary statute, enables it to seek monetary redress and other relief for conduct injurious to consumers. Graham-Leach-Bliley requires financial institutions to safeguard sensitive data. And another quote from the FTC, they say, quote, It is critical that companies and their vendors relying on Log4j act now in order to reduce the likelihood of harm to consumers and to avoid FTC legal action, unquote. The FTC means it. Its warning includes a reference to the complaints against Equifax, which agreed to pay $700 million to settle actions by the FTC, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and all 50 states over its infamous 2017 data leak. According to the Equifax complaint, its failure to patch a known vulnerability, quote, irreversibly exposed the personal information of 147 million consumers, unquote. Expect more of the same if your company fails to protect consumer data from exposure as a result of the log for shell or whatever similar known vulnerabilities crop up, it said. The FTC advised companies to use guidance from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, to check if they're using Apache's Log4j logging library, which is at the heart of the cluster of vulnerabilities known as Log4Shell. Companies that find they are using Log4j should do the following CISA recommends. 1. Update your Log4j software package to the most current version. 2. Consult CISA guidance to mitigate this vulnerability. 3. Ensure remedial steps are taken to ensure that your company's practices do not violate the law. Failure to identify and patch instances of this software may violate the FTC Act. And four, distribute this information to any relevant third-party subsidiaries that sell products or services to consumers who may be vulnerable. On December 17th, CISA issued an emergency directive mandating federal civilian departments and agencies to immediately patch their internet-facing systems for the Log4j vulnerabilities by Thursday, December 23rd. 
Federal agencies were given five more days until December 28th to report log for shell affected products, including vendor and app names and versions, along with what actions have been taken, for example, updated, mitigated, or removed from agency network, to block exploitation attempts. CISA provides a dedicated page for the log for shell flaws with patching information and has released a log for j scanner to hunt down potentially vulnerable web services. The initial flaw was discovered on December 9th and came under attack within hours. As of December 15th, more than 1.8 million attacks against half of all corporate networks using at least 70 distinct malware families have already been launched to exploit what became a trio of bugs. And it goes on to list each of those bugs, which I'm not going to get into here, but basically they found, after the first bug, which was a 10 on a 10 scale, they found uh, two or three more bugs, which were lower severity, but nevertheless still important. In a Monday update, and this would have been last Monday by the time you hear this, Microsoft said that the end of December brought no relief. The company observed state-sponsored and cybercriminal attackers probing systems for the log for shelf law through the month's end. And this is a quote from Microsoft. It says, Microsoft has observed attackers using many of the same inventory techniques to locate targets. Sophisticated adversaries like nation-state actors and commodity attackers alike have been observed taking advantage of these vulnerabilities. There is a high potential for expanded use of the vulnerabilities, unquote. One of the most challenging aspects of responding to the Log4j vulnerability is simply identifying the devices in an organization where Log4j is used. The word ubiquitous has applied since the get-go. And this is a quote from J.J. Guy, who's co-founder and CEO of Sevco Security. He says, quote, Since it is a cross-platform, widely used software library, there is an incredible diversity in where and how it is deployed. It can be an application package installed by itself, bundled with another application as just another file on disk, or embedded in another application with no visible artifact. Even worse, it is used in everything from cloud-managed services to server applications and even fixed-function embedded devices. That internet-connected toaster is very likely vulnerable to log for shell unquote. Okay, so I think it's interesting that the U.S. government is, you know, figuring out what leverage it can use to try to force companies to get on the stick here and get these things fixed because it's really bad. Honestly, we're going to be dealing with this for years to come. More than likely, nation-state level actors and other uh, heavy-duty hacking groups have probably already hacked many of our systems, and they're just waiting to use those back doors that they have installed to do something malicious. So, you know, not only is it a matter of trying to close those doors that exist because of log for shell but now they're going to then have to go through and clean out their systems and root around looking to see what other backdoors have been installed in the meantime using that original flaw to get in honestly this is this is this is bad and there hasn't really been huge fallout yet i don't think uh, that i've heard of but i'm sure we'll probably start with ransomware attacks you know, get hear news stories about companies being shut down or data being lost or threatened to be released unless companies pay big money. Yeah, it's it's not going to be good. But I'm happy to know that our government is taking this seriously and, you know, firing on all cylinders, apparently, to help to mitigate this these problems, help companies figure out if they have them and get them fixed. You know, that's that's the carrot part. Uh, and then now, obviously, whipping out the stick part, too, and threatening, uh, you know, if you don't get on the ball here and, and take reasonable measures to protect yourself and fix these problems and find these vulnerabilities, that there could be consequences. And part, honestly, part of the problem with security, the reason we have so many issues with it today, is there really hasn't been any fallout. There really hasn't been, a, other than maybe bad PR, security and privacy problems don't really get budget. They don't get time. They don't get you know, companies excited to work on. I mean, it's hard to market that to consumers, you know, it's getting easier right now that consumers have gotten burned by these things more often. But I mean, you know, fancy, swanky new features that help them do something tend to take precedence over, oh, and by the way, you know, if you use our product, you're likely not to get hacked. All right, so moving on. I had a nice little rant a few weeks back about QR codes. There was one particular article talking about how evil QR codes and how they were sort of this magical cursed thing that, that you had to be aware of. Uh, and my basic point was, no, they're not. All they are are fancy 
links that you can click on with a camera instead of with a mouse button. That's all they are. They're just links. But links can be dangerous. And so one unique thing about QR codes is, is that they are kind of in the real world. They're, they're not on web pages. They're not in text messages. They're on physical things. They're on the table at the restaurant you're going to. They're, you know, at the window of the food truck when the guy wants you to, you know, use that for payment. And in this case, this article I'm about to read now, they're on parking meters. So this is an article from what looks to be like a Houston TV station's website. It's very short, but let me read it, then I'll talk about the broader implications. Houston is warning the public about a scam they've learned about in Texas cities and may be affecting people using on-street parking stations in Houston. Officials said Wednesday that fraudulent QR codes are being affixed to on-street parking pay stations, or meters. These fraudulent QR codes link to a non-city affiliated website or a fake vendor. In the past three weeks, Houston officials say parking enforcement officers in both San Antonio and Austin discovered fraudulent QR codes affixed to on-street parking pay stations. And then they show a little picture of what one looks like. Basically, at the side of the meter, a lot of these meters now, instead of you putting coins into them, direct you to some online website to pay for your parking. And what some enterprising hackers have done is right around the bottom of these little stickers on these meters that tell you how to pay, they've just stuck a little QR code because, especially now during the pandemic, those of us with mobile phones have been trained to, oh, there's a QR code. Let me just scan this QR code and pay my parking fee. All right, back to the article. A QR code or a quick response code is a two-dimensional barcode that when scanned by a mobile device can almost instantly link the user to a wide variety of information. While fraudulent codes have not yet been seen in Houston, Park Houston said residents need to be aware and educate themselves on proper payment methods. The city of Houston does not use QR codes on any on-street parking pay stations, nor does the city accept payments through QR codes. Payment Houston urges residents to be aware and educate friends and colleagues on proper payment methods. Park Houston said its team is continuing to inspect the city's more than 900 pay stations to ensure there are no QR codes affixed. Now, it's all well and good, but frankly, I'm sure there's a lot of parking meters around the world that do use QR codes. So any city other than Houston, Texas, that doesn't really help you if you see a QR code on the parking machine. Because even if there is a valid QR code there, if I was a hacker, I would replace that. I'd, I'd paste my little fake QR code sticker right on top of the legitimate one. So what do you, what do you do? You, you just got to be careful. You got to pay attention. Don't just blindly scan a QR code and, you know, enter payment information into it. You know, make sure that it's launching the proper website and not some fake website. Or if it happens to launch an app, make sure that it's the official parking app of the city or wherever it is that you're, you know, trying to park. All these things are links. And like any other link, you have to be really careful when you click on it that it actually takes you to the place that you think it's taking you. All right, next up. And if you haven't seen this yet on the news, you are not going to believe this story. <laughs> I, I, I almost couldn't believe it when I read it. But then... Maybe that's not the right way to put it. I, I believe it. I'm jaded enough to to believe that companies would do such a thing. Nevertheless, it had me shaking my head. So I'm going to read two articles from Krebs on Security. The first one talks about Norton 360, which is a popular antivirus software program. Anyway, it says, Norton 360, one of the most popular antivirus products on the market today, has installed a cryptocurrency mining program on its customers' computers. Norton's parent firm says that the cloud-based service that activates the program and allows customers to profit from the scheme, in which the company keeps 15% of any currency's mind, is opt-in, meaning users have to agree to enable it. But many Norton users complain the mining program is difficult to remove, and reactions from long-time customers have ranged from unease and disbelief to, quote, dude, where's my crypto, unquote. Norton 360 is owned by Tempe, Arizona-based Norton LifeLock Incorporated. In 2017, the identity theft protection company LifeLock was acquired by Symantec Corp., which was renamed to Norton LifeLock in 2019. And LifeLock is now included in the Norton 360 service. According to the FAQ posted on its site, Norton Crypto will mine Ethereum cryptocurrency while the customer's computer is idle. The FAQ also says Norton Crypto will only run on systems that meet certain hardware and software requirements, such as an NVIDIA graphics card with at least 6GB of memory. 
And this is a quote from that FAQ. It says, quote, Norton creates a secure digital Ethereum wallet for each user. The key to the wallet is encrypted and stored securely in the cloud. Only you will have access to the wallet, unquote. Norton LifeLock began offering the mining service in July of 2021, and early news coverage of the program did not immediately receive widespread attention. That changed on January 4th, when Cory Doctorow, who we have had on the show before, tweeted that Norton Crypto would run by default for Norton 360 users. Norton LifeLock says that Norton Crypto is an opt-in feature only and is not enabled without user permission. And in a written statement, uh, they said, quote, If users have turned on Norton Crypto but no longer wish to use the feature, it can be disabled by temporarily shutting off tampered protection, which allows users to modify the Norton installation and deleting encrypt.exe from your computer, unquote. However, many users have reported difficulty removing the mining program. From reading user posts on the Norton Crypto Community Forum, it seems some longtime Norton customers were horrified at the prospect of their antivirus product installing coin mining software, regardless of whether the mining service was turned off by default. And one of these uh, posts titled Absolutely Furious says, quote, How on earth could anyone at Norton think that adding crypto mining within a security product would be a good thing, unquote? And then another one says, quote, Norton should be detecting and killing off mining hijacking, not installing their own. The product people need firing. What's the next bright idea? Norton botnet? And I was just about to reinstall Norton 362, but this has literally has caused me to no longer trust Norton and their direction, unquote. It's an open question whether Norton crypto users can expect to see much profit from participating in the scheme, at least in the short run. Mining cryptocurrency basically involves using your computer's spare resources to help validate financial transactions of other crypto users. Crypto mining causes one's computer to draw more power, which can increase one's overall electricity costs. And this is a quote from a security researcher named Chris Vickery. Quote, Norton is pretty much amplifying energy consumption worldwide, costing their customers more in electricity use than the customer makes on the mining, yet allowing Norton to make a ton of profit. It's disgusting, gross, and brand suicide, unquote. Then there's the matter of getting paid. Norton Crypto lets users withdraw their earnings to an account at cryptocurrency platform Coinbase. But as Norton's CryptoFact rightly points out, there are mining fees as well as transaction costs to transfer Ethereum. And the Norton FAQ says, quote, The coin mining fee is currently 15% of the crypto allocated to the miner. Transfers of cryptocurrency may result in transaction fees, also known as quote-unquote gas fees, paid to the users of the cryptocurrency blockchain network who process the transaction. In addition, if you choose to exchange crypto for another currency, you may be required to pay fees to an exchange facilitating the transaction. Transaction fees fluctuate due to cryptocurrency market conditions and other factors. These fees are not set by Norton, unquote. Which might explain why so many Norton crypto users have taken to the community's online forum to complain that they were having trouble withdrawing their earnings. Those gas fees are the same, regardless of the amount of crypto being moved, so the system simply blocks withdrawals if the amount requested can't cover the transfer fees. I guess what bothers me most, and this is assumingly Brian Krebs talking here, about Norton Crypto is that it will be introducing millions of perhaps less savvy internet users to the world of cryptocurrency, which comes with its own set of unique security and privacy challenges that require users to quote-unquote level up their personal security practices in fairly significant ways. Several of my elderly family members and closest friends are longtime Norton users who renew their subscription year after year, despite my reminding them that it's way cheaper to just purchase it again each year as a new user. None of them are particularly interested in or experts at securing their computers and digital lives, and the thought of them opening Coinbase accounts and navigating that space is terrifying. So I would completely agree with Mr. Krebs on that, but it gets worse. And here's another article from him uh, just two days after the first one. Many readers were surprised to learn recently that the popular Norton 360 antivirus suite now ships with a program which lets customers make money mining virtual currency. But Norton 360 isn't alone in this dubious endeavor. A Vira antivirus, which has built a base of 500 million users worldwide largely by making the product free was recently bought by the same company that owns Norton 360 and is introducing its customers to a service called Avira Crypto. Founded in 2006, Avira Operations GmbH and Company, KG, what a funky funky name, 
is a German multinational software company best known for their virus-free security, aka a virus-free antivirus. In January 2021, Avira was acquired by Tempe, Arizona-based Norton LifeLock Incorporated, the same company that now owns Norton 360. In 2017, the identity theft company uh, LifeLock was acquired by Symantec, which was renamed to Norton LifeLock. We covered that. Uh, LifeLock is now included in the Norton 360 service. Avira offers users a similar service called Breach Monitor. Like Norton 360, Avira comes with a crypto miner already installed, but customers have to opt in to using the service that powers it. Avira's FAQ on its crypto mining service is somewhat sparse. For example, it doesn't specify how much Norton LifeLock gets out of the deal. And as we covered in the previous article, Norton LifeLock's crypto, uh, Norton Crypto ticks 15%, but apparently Avira hasn't been specific. Norton's LifeLock hasn't yet responded to requests for comment, so it's unclear whether Avira uses the same crypto mining code as Norton Crypto. But there are clues that suggest that that's the case. Norton LifeLock announced Avira Crypto in late October 21, but multiple other antivirus products have flagged a virus installer as malicious or unsafe for including a crypto miner as far back as September 9th of 2021. And here's the kicker. In August 2021, Norton LifeLock said it had reached an agreement to acquire Avast, another longtime free antivirus product that also claims to have around 500 million users. It remains to be seen whether Avast Crypto will be the next brilliant offering from Norton LifeLock. Okay, so there's a few takeaways from these uh, couple articles. First and foremost, these companies have got to stop this rampant monetization of their customers. I mean, I look, I get it. They're they're supposedly cutting you out on the deal, uh, and they're only going to take a 50% VIG off the top, but... <sighs> Installing crypto mining software like that one user said is what they're supposed to be preventing. Now, look, I've, I admit, I have said this before. It's an interesting bargain, right? I mean, I'd talked about this in the sense of web pages turning to crypto mining instead of uh, advertising and tracking to make money. You know, if you're going to a website for free and consuming their content for free, which was not free to create, they need to, you know, offset their costs somehow. And most of the web today has turned to advertising, which has behind the scenes, thanks to Google and Facebook, means ridiculous data hoarding and tracking. But some websites, and I've mentioned this before, have dabbled in the idea of, you know, like you'll, you'll go to a website and it'll pop up saying, hey, I noticed you have an ad blocker, but, you know, hey, we need to make money. So I'll tell you what, let's make a deal. If you If you let us mine cryptocurrency in this tab of your browser while you're on our website, we'll call it a wash. You get free content. We get to try to make some money on uh, mining cryptocurrency, you know, while you're visiting our website. I honestly, if they're up forward and about that and, and and give you the option, I think that might be a valid choice. But for these antivirus software products, you're you're already paying them for the service. You're paying for this antivirus service. I guess maybe with Avast and Avira, they had free versions, so maybe you weren't. But nevertheless, in introducing, like automatically installing crypto mining software onto your computer is is just anathema. I'm sorry. It's just it just makes zero sense for any antivirus software, any security software to be doing that. Now, so far, it looks like it's opt-in only, like even though it's already installed, it's not doing anything unless you say yes, but I mean, we've all seen with dark patterns how they trick you into saying yes to things you don't mean to say yes to and you know, who's to say that at some point they can't just take that choice away and make it opt out. This is this is just slimy. And it's it's just bad. So that's takeaway number one. Takeaway number two is that like VPN software services, there is apparently a huge consolidation in the antivirus uh, software business. And that's generally not a good thing either, especially when it's not obvious to the end user that all these companies, these supposedly competing products are really all owned by one big conglomeration company. So point three, and this is a point I've made, uh, several times. And this is backed up by a lot of security people that I know and trust is that today you probably should not be installing third-party antivirus software. Uh, it's just not worth it. Honestly, you know, Windows and Macintosh come with basic protections and Windows actually has antivirus software built in by Microsoft called Defender that is quite good. Certainly if you're a Windows user, I would be using that and not using anything else for your antivirus. And on Mac, 
Apple doesn't really talk about it. It does have built-in protections, some pretty good ones, honestly, to prevent you from accidentally installing malware. They don't really call it antivirus software, but you know it's it is security software. It's you know putting in roadblocks in place to uh, to try to protect you that are probably sufficient as long as you don't as long as you really don't do anything dumb. The other thing I would add is that you should be using a non-administrator account for your day-to-day activities on any computer, which means that every computer you own should have at least two accounts, an admin account and a non-admin account. Particularly on Windows, this would have blocked a lot of horrendous uh, malware outcomes. There have been studies that have shown that. So at this point, honestly, I've got a whole article on my website called The Pros and Cons of Antivirus Software. It's one of the most popular articles I've posted. It gets hit a lot uh, that you can check out for more information. But I, I would not be paying for uh, one of these services. Now, they come with all these other bundled services, right? Like, you know, LifeLock, right? Uh, Identity theft protection. That's kind of a separate thing. You know, maybe if you want to buy that, you know, if you want to get cyber insurance of some sort, that's a separate consideration. But I would not be buying any kind of bundle that includes that with an antivirus software. Okay, let's move on. Tax filing in the United States is quite the industry, and it's got a, f- a very storied history and an ugly history uh, of lots of companies like H&R Block originally, and then eventually Intuit, who makes TurboTax, basically lobbying Congress to do two things. First of all, to not simplify the tax code, to not make it so simple that their products would no longer be needed. And also for the government not to provide any sort of free way to file your taxes and help you figure out what your taxes are to get them filed, because that would be competition for them that they don't want. So many years ago, uh, when the government basically threatened these companies to simplify the tax code and to provide free software of some sort or a website or something where, you know, people could freely file their taxes and bypass the need for things like, you know, H&R Block and TurboTax and whatever, these companies, lobbyists kicked into high gear and they came up with this supposed compromise that basically said, okay, The government will agree not to make software that will help people file their taxes as long as you guys opt into this free file program that means that you must offer free file programs of your own and that those free file programs have to be restricted. They can't try to upsell people for no reason. They can't push other products and services to try to make money. They had to be very streamlined and very focused on just helping people file their taxes. And what ended up happening, which we should have foreseen, and that ProPublica exposed some years ago, is that these companies made it really hard for users to find those free file programs. They had their own, quote unquote, free programs that were kind of, you know, in parallel. And if you search for those on Google, the ones that popped up were the, not the government mandated free file programs, but, uh, you know, into its other parallel free program that didn't have all those restrictions that could, you know, upsell you to other products or say, oh, you know, you almost could have done the free version, but since you need this one special thing, you're going to have to pay for the upgraded version. Click here. And, you know, dark patterns, basically. It was very slimy. And and then basically nobody used these free free file programs because they couldn't find them, which was not by accident. Anyway, and now it's come to this. So let me read this article from the Detroit Free Press. TurboTax, which has been criticized for some sketchy tactics when it came to providing online access free of charge through the IRS site, is now shocking taxpayers by informing them that the big brand name has exited the free file program. The news officially was released in July, which frankly is a fantastic time to sneak in a tax change. Most early filers don't start thinking about their taxes until January or February, and some are now surprised to learn online or via email of a significant change ahead for free file. TurboTax notes online, quote, Intuit has elected not to renew its participation in the IRS free file program and will no longer be offering IRS free file program delivered by TurboTax, unquote. TurboTax is the second big name to stop participating. H&R Block exited free file in October of 2020. The Internal Revenue Service, or IRS, is expected to announce the start of tax season in the near future. If we don't see delays, the tax season could kick off in late January. This year, 2021 returns are due on April 18th, according to IRS instructions online for the tax season. The majority of people buy tax software to do it themselves or hire tax professionals to handle their income tax returns. Millions of lower-income families and elderly people also turn to volunteers who prepare tax returns for free. 
Yet a simple way to cut down on costs, which many people oddly don't tap into, remains the IRS free file system if you qualify. Why pay $40 or $50 or more for online software if you don't have to? The free file program at irs.gov gives eligible taxpayers free access to brand name software programs offered by rival tax prep companies. Those who qualify can use online software that prompts filers with key tax questions, does the math, and allows you to file returns electronically for free. E-filing helps the IRS process returns and issue refunds more quickly than a return filed by paper. TurboTax was but one partner in FreeFile. Those who selected TurboTax last year are able to opt for another online tax preparation service in the FreeFile program. Last year, there were nine taxware software products available via FreeFile in English and two in Spanish. If your adjusted gross income was $73,000 or less in 2021, you can use free tax software to prepare and electronically file your tax return according to IRS instructions online for the 2021 tax season. If you earned more, you can use free file forms. See the irs.gov slash free file to research options. And that's all one word, free file. Roughly 70% of taxpayers based on income qualify for some software services offered, but only a small fraction of those who qualify actually use free file. More than 4.2 million taxpayers used one of the free online partner products that are part of the free file in 2020, according to the data from the IRS. This is excluding the millions of non-filers who use the system to claim economic impact payments. For fiscal year 2020, the IRS processed more than 150 million individually electronically filed returns. Why has free file participation been so historically low, even after an uptick in 2020? Is it because taxpayers don't know about the heavily hyped free file? I would argue with heavily hyped. Or did taxpayers go online and end up being directed somewhere else for tax services? We're not talking about a new program. It's been around for 20 years since the IRS first entered into a special agreement to encourage tax software companies to provide free tax return software to a certain percentage of U.S. taxpayers. But in exchange, the bargain included getting the IRS to agree that it would not compete with these companies by providing its own software to taxpayers. Big names like Intuit's TurboTax and H&R Block faced much criticism back in 2019 after a ProPublica investigation detailed how the companies limited the program's reach by making free options more difficult to find online and instead figuring out a way to steer eligible taxpayers into products that weren't free. ProPublica's reporting included pointing out that Intuit added code to the free file landing page of TurboTax that hid it from search engines like Google, making it hard to find. In January 2020, the IRS announced some changes designed to offer more consumer protections. One such change? Tax preparation firms agreed that they would not exclude free file landing pages from an organic internet search. And, and let me just stop here to explain what, what they're talking about there. If you want to get your business found on the, on the internet, you need to be searchable by Google, and you want your results to pop up to the top when that happens. There are very few instances, and this is one of them, where a company does not want to be found. <laughs> so where search engines like Google crawl the web, as they say, looking for every website it can find so that it can, you know, offer those as possible search results. There are ways to explicitly tell Google and other search engines, hey, don't list me on your website. I don't want to be found. This is an internal private web page that has no business being on a public search result page. So just, just ignore me, go away. And basically... <laughs> That is what these companies were doing to try to prevent people from finding these, because most people try to find stuff by searching for it. That's how you, you know, that's how you find things on the internet today. If you don't know the website, sometimes even if you do and don't feel like typing it, you'll go to Google and search for it. So you can just click on that link. Well, these companies decided to make the government sponsored free file program just not show up so that people couldn't find it. All right. Anyway, back to the article. The IRS suggested that taxpayers search for standard labeling, quote, IRS free file program delivered by, and then in parentheses it says name of software provider, unquote. So basically, the IRS tried to work around this by saying, okay, to find these things, here's the magic incantation. You go to the search engine and you search for literally, quote, IRS free file program delivered by Intuit or delivered by H&R Block. If you searched on that explicit text, that was still supposed to bring it up, even, it was, even though it was trying to be hidden. Back to the article. As part of the IRS free file, taxpayers cannot be offered bank products that often carry fees, such as high-cost refund anticipation loans. 
If you used IRS Free Fallout last year, you're required to receive an email from the same company that you used, welcoming you back to their official IRS Free File services. The email must include a link to the company's IRS Free File site and explain how to file with it. If you choose this email link and qualify, you will not be charged for preparation and e-filing of the federal tax return. Some consumers report receiving emails from TurboTax in December, alerting them that the company is no longer participating in free file. In an Intuit blog post dated July 17th, the company said it has participated in free file for nearly 20 years and has helped millions of Americans prepare and electronically file their tax returns for free. Intuit blamed the lack of participation during the upcoming tax season on, quote, limitations of the free file program and conflicting demands from those outside the program, unquote. U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts took a shot in July on Twitter at Intuit for exiting the free file program and said that, quote, the IRS can and should create its own free tax preparation and filing system, unquote. Back in early 2020, before the pandemic hit, the IRS said it was no longer promising not to enter the tax return software and e-file services marketplace. The pledge no longer exists for not creating a government-run system. Then it seemed there was a flicker of hope. The pandemic, though, hit the IRS hard. Shutdowns to stem the spread of COVID-19 in the spring of 2020 triggered delays in processing income tax returns and issuing refunds. The IRS also picked up extra work for rolling out economic impact payments and later the advanced child tax credits to shore up the economy. It wasn't pretty. Going forward, it only makes sense for the IRS to work harder to give taxpayers even more access to no-cost software options for those willing to do their own tax returns. Getting Congress to really simplify the tax code wouldn't hurt either. I wouldn't bet on seeing these kinds of big changes soon. Yeah, okay, so a lot of stuff covered there. I'm not sure how much I can add to that. It's pretty obvious just from the article what's going on here. But at the end of the day, what we really need to do is we really just need to simplify the tax code for the vast majority of people. I don't know why we haven't done this already. Well, okay, I know why we haven't done this already. It's because of lobbyists from companies that H&R are blocking into it. The government has all the information they need for most tax filers to automatically fill out your tax return for you. There is no reason why you should not be able to go to irs.gov, create an account, which by the way, anybody can do at any time. And I recommend that you do, because if you don't do it, a hacker might do it for you. And then just see all the money you made and all the taxes you paid for the previous tax year, have them show you whether you owe money or you're going to get money back and you just click OK. For the vast, vast majority of people, this could be done easily. Anyway, okay, let me get off that soapbox. But there was there was a really great interview I did on this a while back. I'll If I can find the link to it, I'll put that in the show notes. But you can just go to the in my podcast website and search for it there, and I'm sure it'll come right up. All right, two more articles here, both about Google, but very different articles. This one's from a website called The Tech Republic, and it's titled, Google Makes the Perfect Case for Why You Shouldn't Use Chrome. Back in 2020, Google released Manifest V3, or version 3, which it called a step in the direction of security, privacy, and performance. It took a while, but on December 9th, 2021, the Electronic Frontier Foundation labeled MV3, or Manifest V3, a, quote, conflict of interest that comes from Google controlling both the dominant web browser and one of the largest internet advertising networks, unquote. The EFF is right, and Google's plans for MV3 is yet another reason why the best browser for Linux, Windows, and Mac isn't Google Chrome. Let me explain. Manifest V3 for Chrome Extensions, or MV3, is a set of guidelines for how Google's web browser handles extensions. And in this case, by the way, extensions are like plugins. These are things that you add onto your web browser, like an ad blocker, for example, that works with your web browser to do fun and interesting things while you surf the web. Developers could begin uploading extensions to the Chrome Web Store starting with Chrome 8, which was released on January 2021. According to Google, MV3 is designed to help the company provide, quote, improvements to security, performance, and privacy while preserving or extending the capability of extensions and keeping a webby developer experience, unquote. I don't know what a webby developer experience is. Now, on the service, MV3 could be seen as a means to a very protective end. Why? Because there are browser extension developers who are creating malicious tools to thwart the security of browsers. To that end, MV3 will go a very long way to restrict the capabilities of web browser extensions. This is good. Very good. It's also long overdue. Almost daily, we hear of yet another threat to web browser safety, and many times that lack of security is found to be a problem with an extension. 
So, for Google to create guidance that would prevent bad actors from doing what they do is a major win for those who take web browser security seriously. However, there's another side to this coin. There are a lot of developers who create extensions on which millions upon millions of users depend. Among that massive group of users are those who install ad blockers and other extensions to prevent websites from collecting and using their data. Case in point, according to the 2021 PageFair ad block report from ad firm Blockthrough, the number of people using ad blocking software on mobile browsers is 586 million, and on desktop browsers is 257 million. Those are not small numbers. And those numbers are only going to continue to rise as more and more sites deploy a larger percentage of ads. The question then becomes, are the current numbers low enough such that Google can brush them off? Because when MV3 is put into place, Chrome users who prefer to use a browser with ad blocking extensions in place could be out of luck. To complicate this issue, if potentially breaking ad blockers wasn't enough, MV3 could also negatively affect user privacy by preventing extensions that block third-party tracking from functioning. Chrome does offer incognito mode, which is designed to prevent sites from tracking user activity, so Google understands that privacy is important to users. And I'm going to circle back to that uh, at the end. It's not what most people think it is. But anyone that's used incognito mode knows it's not enough. Although it does help with the prevention of tracking, sort of, it doesn't block ads. And although I don't have a problem with businesses promoting themselves with ads because companies do have to keep the lights on, not every ad is created equal, and some have been found to be quite malicious. I know users who install ad blocking extensions as a means to hopefully prevent malicious ads from infecting their desktops. It's a shame then that MV3 could take away another tool users have to protect their privacy and the integrity of the devices they use. From my perspective, Google is making a perfect case for why users should migrate away from Chrome. MV3 doesn't just create issues for end users. Developers could face challenges as well. According to the EFF, quote, the changes in Manifest V3 won't stop malicious extensions, but will hurt innovation, reduce extension capabilities, and harm real-world performance. Google is right to ban remotely hosted code, with some exceptions for things like user scripts, but this is a policy change that didn't need to be bundled with the rest of Manifest V3, unquote. The EFF is spot on. Yes, Google should, with few exceptions, ban remote code, but releasing guidance that breaks so much functionality for third-party extensions isn't the way to go. And for developers, this could lead to many of them having to work with two different code bases, one for Chrome and one for all other browsers. That's a proposition many developers won't accept. Is it in Google's best interest to prevent the development and usage of ad blocking extensions? Probably not. But by creating guidance that prevents those developers from creating non-malicious, often helpful add-ons, they are putting themselves in a rather awkward position. End users should be able to leverage as much privacy as they want with a browser. And the fact that Chrome comes with an incognito mode that prevents tracking, no it doesn't, makes it clear Google understands how important privacy is. If Google's MV3 presents the creation of ad blockers for Chrome, what are those users to do? In an ideal world, there would be a widely agreed upon and enforceable set of rules for users' privacy and security that browser makers would follow, similar to how countries have laws that govern safety standards for automobiles. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. In other words, regulations. Google and other browser makers have way too much time, capital, and resources invested into their creations to allow a third party to take control. On top of that, Google would have to collaborate with Apple, Microsoft, Mozilla, Opera, Brave, Vivaldi, and any other browser maker that has a vested interest in the issue. Again, not going to happen. The other issue with using a third party is that no one with proper authority to govern such a body exists. We all know how slow governments are to implement such a change. This is technology, where change happens in the blink of an eye. If a government did get involved, by the time it voted something like this into existence, the need for it would have probably already been mitigated. I'm not holding my breath for a third party to take control of the situation, and neither should you. So, what can you do? The solution is simple. Change browsers. Migrate to a browser which doesn't prevent you from using ad blockers and other extensions which prevent the collection of your data. Switch to a browser that's not based on Chrome such as Firefox for Linux, Mac OS, or Windows, or Safari for Mac OS. Use any browser based on Chrome, and you run the risk of losing the ability to install those extensions. It's your web browser, your experience, your security, and your data. You should have the final say in what can and cannot be added to bolster the privacy of the application and the data it uses. Okay, so a few things. First of all, incognito mode. Unless Google has somehow changed this, all incognito mode does, all these private browsing modes do, is prevent local storage of cookies 
beyond your session and your history, which is to say that <laughs> this is basically to prevent someone else in your household, say your spouse or maybe your kids from getting onto your computer and going back and being able to figure out what you were doing when you were in private browsing mode. It has zero effect whatsoever on the websites you visit and those websites' ability to remember that you were there and did something. It also does not block intersite tracking. You know, if you're doing all your browsing within one incognito mode and an advertising network on site A drops a cookie, then that same advertising network on site B can then read that cookie. Again, unless Chrome has somehow updated this recently, which I don't think they did. But again, what you got to realize is that Chrome, the Chrome browser made by Google, is based off an underlying open source engine that Google also makes called Chromium. And many popular browsers today are based off of Chromium, like Microsoft Edge and Brave, and I think Opera, which means that if Google adopts this, and they have said that they're going to, any browser based on that Chromium engine is going to have these same limitations. And let me try to explain what this manifest v3 thing is. It's kind of a specification for how one would write an extension that would work in a Chromium-based web browser. So if you're going to create an extension like an ad blocker or a tracking blocker, you would have to comply with this specification. I mean, it's not like it's even like a written set of rules that, that you could try to get away with working around. It's the functioning of the browser. Like this is the way the browser now works. And the things you were doing before are just not possible. And my favorite ad blocking and tracking blocking extension, uBlock Origin, is one of the ones that would basically become useless with Manifest V3. Meaning that on any Chromium-based web browser, including Chrome and Edge, would not be able to effectively prevent ads and tracking once this Manifest V3 goes into effect. So at the end of the day, this is one of many reasons that I recommend using Firefox and not Chrome. And like this uh, author of this article says, it's, it's actually a phenomenal reason <laughs> to stop using Chrome. All right, one last article involving Google and Apple in this case. Uh, and then this will lead into my tips of the week and our New Year's resolutions. All right, this is from Mac Rumors, and it's about the agreement that Google and Apple have to basically make Google the default search engine on Apple products, and even a little bit deeper than that, which is kind of disturbing. So let me read this article. Apple has an agreement with Google that it won't develop its own internet search engine so long as Google pays it to remain the default option in Safari, a new class action alleges. Filed in California court earlier this week against Apple, Google, and their respective CEOs, the lawsuit alleges the two companies have a non-compete agreement in the internet search business that violates U.S. antitrust laws. Specifically, the complaint charges that Apple CEO Tim Cook and Google CEO Sundar Pichai of participating in quote-unquote regular secret meetings in which Google agrees to share its profits with Apple if it is given preferential treatment on devices like the iPhone and iPad. The class action also alleges that Google pays Apple annual multi-billion dollar payments based on an agreement that Apple won't launch its own competing search engine and that the non-compete agreement includes plans to actively suppress smaller competitors and acquire actual and potential competitors. The complaint claims that the advertising rates are subsequently higher than rates would be in a competitive system. It therefore seeks an injunction prohibiting the non-compete agreement between Apple and Google, a cessation of the profit-sharing agreement and preferential treatment, and an end to the multi-billion dollar payments. Lastly, the complaint calls for, quote, the breakup of Google into separate and independent companies and the breakup of Apple into separate and independent companies in accordance with the precedent of the breakup of Standard Oil Company into Exxon, Mobil, Conoco, Amoco, Sohio, Chevron, and others, unquote. It's no secret that Apple and Google have a considerable monetary agreement that ensures Google's position as the default search engine on Apple devices. Neither company has ever confirmed exactly how much Google pays but to be the default search engine on Apple devices in the United States, the United Kingdom, and other countries, but it's rumored to be in the billions. In 2020, the New York Times reported that Apple receives an estimated $8 to $12 billion per year in exchange for making Google the default search on its devices. According to one analyst, Google's payment to Apple in 2021 to maintain this status quo may have reached up to $15 billion. This is believed to be the single biggest payment Google makes to anyone, 
and could account for up to a fifth of Apple's annual profits. But it's also drawn scrutiny in the past, in particular from the U.S. Justice Department, which claims that the deal is representative of illegal tactics used to protect Google's monopoly and stifle competition. The U.K. Competition and Markets Authority has also called the arrangement a, quote, significant barrier to entry and expansion, unquote, for rivals in the search engine market, and in 2020 asked for enforcement authorities to be provided with a range of options to address the deal between Apple and Google to provide a more level playing field for other search engines. Apple and Google would likely argue that while the payments are indeed for Google to remain the default search option, users can select other search engines in Safari, including Microsoft's Bing, Apollo Fund's Yahoo, and independent search engines DuckDuckGo and Ecosia. All right, the article goes on. But I wanted to call this out because I, as an admitted Apple fanboy, I wanted to also make sure that I'm calling out when Apple is doing something kind of shady. And this is actually something that I have been complaining about for many, many years with Apple is that they do, in fact, make Google the default search engine when they claim to be a privacy-oriented company, and those two things just don't go together. Honestly, at this point, I can't imagine why Apple has not abandoned Google and actually created its own search engine itself, or bought a company like DuckDuckGo, or whatever. I mean, it says it, that $15 billion would be 20% of their annual profits. I can't believe that's true. Apple makes way, way more money than that, I thought. But I mean, you know, Apple switched away from Intel processors recently to make their own processors because, well, for lots of reasons. And if Apple really wants to be a privacy company, I don't see how they could keep making Google the default. Yes, the user can change it, but we've talked several times in this program about the tyranny of the default, which says basically that people don't change the defaults. Even if for some reason they figure out they can change this, they often don't. And so whatever the default is, is very likely to be highly sticky. And Google knows it. And that is why they're paying Apple a lot of money to keep it that way. All right, so it is 2022 and we have just passed the New Year's. And this is a time when we collectively, <laughs> as a human group, have adopted this notion that this magical time, this change of calendar year, is the point at which we wipe the slate clean and we forget about the past and we look forward and we damn it this year is going to be different than last year we're going to make changes and we codify these things in new year's resolutions i've never really a huge fan of resolutions but i do often use the start of the new year to think about things i want to get done in the next year and i will add things to my to-do list so in that sense i guess i i have quote unquote new year's resolutions but i know a lot of people do do these things. And if I do take this opportunity to throw out some ideas that, you know, I think that you might want to put on your to-do list to make some, you know, resolutions for 2022 to improve your security and privacy. Now uh, I've done this for, I think four years in a row. Now I have, there's a blog article that I write every year uh, about these resolutions. And if you search on New Year's resolutions, uh, my website, Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons, you will find these previous lists. Uh, obviously, if you go right now, the top entry is going to be the list for this year, and I'm going to cover a lot of that here today. But the, the key thing is that that article also has links to the previous year's lists. Uh, last year's was really good. I was actually quite proud of last year's list. It had some really, I think, great ideas for people to you know, improve the security of their home network. Uh, and then the previous two years, I, you know, when I first started doing this thing, I did sort of do like a top 10 list kind of thing. So they're going to be a little bit repetitive. And I will throw out some of those things briefly before we're done. But what I want to do this year, uh, a little bit different, is I'm going to tell you what my resolutions are, what I'm adding to my to-do list, things that I am trying to commit to complete in the next calendar year to improve my security and privacy. I'm a privacy guy, right? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a security guy. I talk about this stuff constantly. And you might think, well, gee, what, what could Carrie possibly have left to do? Well, it turns out that I am human like the rest of you. I've got things that I need to do that I should have done a long time ago that I have not yet done that, gosh darn it, I want to try to get done in 2022. But, and first of all, we will start off with step one, and that is, hi, my name is Carrie Parker, and I have a Google problem. So, Look, I'm a, I'm a technologist. <laughs> always have been, always will be. I love my tech. And back when Google, and this goes back to 2004, uh, on April Fool's Day, no less, 
first introduced this pet project and Google was has been famous for these side projects that they let their employees come up with and trial out called Gmail, Google Mail. And you know, the, the, these were innocent times. <laughs> this was back before Google was a massive advertising and tracking data hoarding company. And I I loved it. I thought it was super cool. It was a web-based email client, which was a totally new thing. And I I jumped in. I with both feet. I was all in fact, not only did I jump in real quick and and I secured, you know, my favorite chosen user ID for Gmail, which would certainly have been snapped up by somebody else if I waited. I went ahead and got ones for my daughters as well. They were toddlers at the time. <laughs> but I knew that as a technologist, I wanted to reserve those accounts for them when they were old enough to use them. And then a couple of years later, Google came out with Google Calendar, and I jumped on that too. And over the years, uh, you know, me and my friends and family have, have used Google all over the place. And in particular, me and my family have used Google Calendar to stay synchronized. Um, we would post things on each other's calendars so that we could share and see those things, and it was quite helpful. So I am deep, deep into Google. And over the years... Uh, I've used Google Docs uh, and some of these other things that are honestly wonderful products. I mean, from a purely technological standpoint and a functionality standpoint, they're great products. Like, for instance, on Gmail, I, I basically never get spam. Their spam filters are wonderful. Google Docs is, for 90% of what people want to do with, like, Microsoft Office, you know, when we're talking about Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel, you know, Google Docs has that covered. And it all works in a web browser. You don't have to download anything. And you can share it easily with somebody else and you could actually collaborate with those people in real time. Honestly, it's great. If, <laughs> if it wasn't for all the tracking. I, honestly, I wouldn't even mind if there were some ads kind of sprinkled around non-intrusively. As long as those weren't tracking me. And that, that is really my problem. And so I've been wanting to de-Google my life for a long time. And, and, and I will admit, in a lot of ways I have done that. I've moved on to several other email services for a lot of my primary stuff. Certainly all my business stuff is, is not on Google. Other than, you know, YouTube, you know, where I post videos because that's where people are. But I still have feet in the old Google ecosystem that I need to try to extract. And because I'm so deeply embedded and, and honestly, because I've, my family and I have been using it for so long, it's, I will not be able to completely extract myself from Google. And I fully admit that. And I fully understand when other people tell me the same thing. I actually know several, honestly, security and privacy people that use Gmail for their email, because when they send me emails, they're coming from gmail.com, probably for similar reasons. But just to stand on principle, I want to minimize to the best of my ability, my dependence on Google. Now, there's one huge caveat. If Google would just let me pay, I would happily pay good money for the products and services that I am currently using. They're great services. If they would just stop tracking me, if they would just stop trying to monetize my data, if they would give me true end-to-end -end encryption uh, on all of this stuff, I would pay for that. I would pay good money for that. But to date, they just haven't done that. Now, Google does have something that they call Google Workspace, and this is their business offering. This is their enterprise offering. So this is a for-pay service that supposedly has a lot better privacy, and it does have some limited use of client-side encryption that should mean that Google has no real access to the customer's data. But it's it's not built for regular, everyday people like you and I. It's built for collaboration. It's built for business. It's built for companies. And and so it's really kind of clunky and not easy to set up. I mean, it kind of assumes you sort of have an IT role defined for your company that would manage all of these things, you know, because, you know, with this service, I could manage all the email accounts of everybody in my organization. I don't need that. I'm just a personal user. So uh, I hope somehow that either maybe because of regulations or maybe just the threat of regulations that Google kind of wakes up and says, okay, people do care about privacy. And if we don't get on this, we're going to be forced to do it anyway. So, you know, why don't we give people the option of paying for our services and giving them the privacy to boot? If they ever do that, I will be a very happy person. And I will probably be one of the first people in line to pay for that, but they don't have that now. So what does that mean to me? So first of all, now, I can get off of Gmail uh, almost entirely. I'm not going to close my account because a lot of people still have that email and I will get stuff to that account and I don't want to give up that user ID, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I can basically forward everybody to other email services. And I 
I actually have done that to a good degree. I need to do a little bit more, mostly for friends and family. Google has always been my personal account, never my junk account. I had a Yahoo account that I used and honestly still use for a lot of spammy email stuff. And I need to get off of that one too. But email's a little easier because email's a standard and, you know, all I got to do is give somebody a new address and and use whatever other email provider I want. And in fact, if I own a web domain, which I own several, I can actually own any email address I want off of that uh, off of that web domain until I die, as long as I keep paying for the web domain. And because behind the scenes, you can actually support that domain with any email service you want, including Google, if you wanted to. Uh, I like Fastmail, but you could also do ProtonMail, uh, Tutanota, and, and several others that are very privacy respecting. You can have them actually run your email behind the scenes and give them your custom domain. And then you own every single address at that domain. For example, firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. Uh, I own that domain. So I can make up any email address I want at firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com and it will all come to me. And behind the scenes, Fastmail runs that service for me currently. And if I want to change that to ProtonMail, I could do that and nobody would ever know the difference. So in my email, is actually pretty straightforward. I just need to basically at this point, <laughs> here, honestly, here's what's been holding me back all this time on doing exactly what I'm about to say. I need to just tell everybody, hey, everybody, here's my new email address. Now use this one. Don't use the other one. <laughs> but I've got so many email addresses. I, I need to figure out which email address I want to make my personal email address for the rest of my life. Cause I want to do this one more time and be done with it. Uh, and I, I cannot, <laughs> cannot seem to make that decision. But anyway, this year, darn it. I'm going to figure that out. I'm going to make that choice. And I'm going to tell everybody to start using this to stop using Gmail. Now, Google Calendar, this is the tough one. I, I, I'm going to stop using it for business stuff. Uh, actually, Fastmail's got great calendars, and ProtonMail and Tutanota have built-in calendars as well. That's not an issue. Given that my business stuff is probably Fastmail-oriented, I'll probably just use uh, their calendar, which is quite good, uh, and move my personal stuff over there as well. Something like that. I'll move it off of Google. And But for family stuff, you know, I can't expect my family members to just drop Google because I'm doing it. Uh, so we will probably still keep our family calendars uh, on Google. And luckily, the way calendar stuff is set up, you can integrate that with other things. So for instance, I could still go into, let's say, Fastmail's calendar, and uh, I could import my Google calendars there as well, so I could still see them all on one page. The other thing I need to do when I, when I get away from Google G, uh, Gmail is I need to also move all my contacts um, I've got a lot of contacts there. I try to use Apple's contacts for my master list, but you know every email service provider you use is going to have contacts as well, and I need to consolidate that. That'll be tedious, but won't be hard. And then I need to minimize my use of Google Docs, which honestly, I'm not sure how much more I can minimize it. Um, I've tried using some alternatives. Uh, Zoho Docs is a big competitor that costs money. They're pretty good, but man, uh, Google Docs, honestly just makes sense. Like a, it's just so intuitive. And, and the way I use it it, 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 it's just so easy for me to use. It's really hard for me to, to move off to something else, but I'll look at Zoho docs. That's another one that I could use. It's um, for pay that could be private. There's crypt pad, which I actually already pay for. It's a highly secure office suite, uh, web-based office suite, but it's just, it's just clunky. It's slow to load. It's really slow to load. And uh, honestly, I think I'm going to end up stop, pay, stop paying for that as much as I want to support them. It's just I probably end up paying for something else instead. And maybe it's Zoho docs. Uh, and there are others. And if you look at my blog article, there's some other ones you could look at there that you might look at uh, if you're considering doing the same thing. But I had so many friends of mine that share stuff through Google docs. It's just, there's just no way I'm going to be able to get away from that entirely. Now it should already be noted. There are many other things uh, that I've already moved away from on Google things that I have done. And I've recommended that you do that is I don't use Google Chrome I don't use Google search. I don't use Waze, which is owned by Google. I don't use Android, which is owned by Google. I don't have any Nest products, which are owned by Google. Uh, I use Firefox. I use DuckDuckGo. I use Apple Maps, which have gotten a lot better. They got a lot of flack early on, and rightly so. It was not well done. Apple Maps has come a long way. Um, that's really good. There's also OpenStreetMap. Uh, if you're not an Apple user, that's also quite good. And I don't use Android. I use iOS because I'm an Apple guy. And uh, my doorbell is not a Ring doorbell, which is Amazon, um, but there, I think there's probably a Nest doorbell as well. Uh, but I use one from Eufy. And one reason I like Eufy, which is spelled E-U-F-Y, and maybe I'm mispronouncing that, but that's why I, that's what I call it. They integrate with Apple's HomeKit uh, Secure Home Video, which I really like. And as far as file sharing, now, I, you know, um, Google Docs is, I use Google Docs when I have to collaborate with other people on spreadsheets and Word documents and, this, and those sorts of things. But when I want to share files with people, uh, and I did get my family to switch to this, I use sync.com. 
That's sync.com. I've got an article on that on my website too, if you want to get into the details of why I picked them. Uh, and there are some others. Tresserit's another one that people talk about. There, Spider Oak, if they're still around. Uh, there are some other privacy-oriented, end-to-end encrypted cloud storage and synchronizing services for files that you can use. Uh, I happen to like sync.com. Okay, so what are some other goals that I have for 2022 and ones that you might use as well? Now, one that won't surprise you if you've listened to the show for very long is that I'm in the process of canceling my debit cards. I had one that I've already canceled that was hacked through no fault of my own, wrote a really extensive article on that and what happened there and why you should do the same thing. And luckily, they didn't hack my business debit card, which I use for a lot of stuff. I didn't want to get a whole credit card for business and business credit cards are kind of wonky anyway. But I've got enough credit cards that I think I'm going to end up doing is canceling my business debit card completely and turning it into an ATM only card, um, which, you know, the bank still wants you to have one of those. And sometimes you use it to authenticate at the bank when you're doing transactions. So anyway, that's fine. Uh, but I want to cancel it as a debit card. And so what instead what I'll do is I'm going to shuffle shuffle my credit cards around so I can make one of those credit cards basically my business credit card. And it's where all my business expenses will go. So for tax purposes, I can keep keep track of all that stuff there. Another thing I do real, actually every year around this time, and I'll recommend it uh, that you do too and start doing it if you haven't already, is to update my estate info. Now, if you don't already have a will and power of attorney and all that stuff, you definitely need to get one. Even if you don't have a lot of stuff, even you know, you're not a rich person, whatever, just it doesn't cost a lot of money. You can get it done once and, and be done with it. If you've got kids, if if you've got anybody, honestly, that you want to you know, delegate your stuff to when you die, or if you get in, incapacitated, you need a power of attorney. Uh, those are documents you definitely should have. But what I do in those documents, and I'm not going to redo those because I don't need to, but in those documents, I point to other documents. I say in those, you know, and my lawyer knows this, that if I were to die, go look at these other documents that will have further instructions that don't need to be really put in a legal document because I might change them. You know, like who, you know, special stuff, like maybe my, my record collection or uh, my nostalgia collection or my computers or my journals, you know, what do I, what do I want to happen to those things? I'm not going to put that in a legal document, but I do every year go back and revisit a document where I kind of talk about those things. And, you know, so if I were to die, my family knows that if I've got anything particular, I want to happen with certain things that I own, what I want done with those things. Furthermore, uh, from a digital standpoint, I've also got pointers to LastPass and my password manager. And so that if they need to get access to my accounts, uh, they can do that as well. And that is really, really important. Not just your passwords, by the way, but whatever device you use for two-factor authentication, they're going to need access to that as well. Now, it's important to note that your digital estate, your photos, your music, your files, uh, they can be handled separately. If you want, you can actually appoint a digital executor. That's a term I made up. I don't think that's an actual legal term, but you could basically designate a separate person to handle that if you want, or you could just designate that, Hey, I want that stuff just deleted. I don't want anyone to see this. I don't want to pass any of that on. You know, my computer should be wiped clean. And that's what, that's what I want done. So just like you can tell people what you want to do with your baseball card collection, you can tell people what you want to have done with your digital journals. And, you know, so this is a good time of year to revisit all those things. Make sure you have all those things in order and up to date, you know, a list of all your accounts that they might need access to with, you know, account numbers and login information and passwords and all those kind of things. And that would also be a good time to review those accounts and say, you know what, I don't use that one anymore. That'd be a good time to close that account. So anyway, it's, a, it's, you can do this any time of the year, but this will be a time when you might want to add that to your to-do list for the year and make sure that you get around to doing those things. And then finally, uh, <laughs> and I've just been busy with family and stuff over December and I just haven't gotten around to it, but that Priv app that I told you guys about, which I still think is really cool. Uh, I need to dig in there and finish going through those checklists myself, including the one that they have for my book, which is super cool. Uh, I want to go through and finish uh, going through that list, which I, my guess is I will probably address most of the things in there, but maybe not. Uh, I need to find out. So I need to go through, that's on my list of things to do. I need to go through their checklists and make sure that I have gone through and addressed all of those and see what my score is. So those are things that I am planning to do in 2022. And maybe in uh, next year, when we do this again, I'll report back and say how successful I was. But those are things that I think all of you could consider or things like those things. Now, of course, 
if you haven't done these next things, you need to do them anyway. This is sort of the top five list. You you know use a password manager. If you're not using one, you you really need to use one. You also need to use two-factor authentication wherever you can. You need to back up everything uh, to multiple places for those things that are really important. You really need to secure your home network. This has gotten extremely important in the era of Internet of Things. Uh, so my um, my article about this from last year would be a great first stop for that. And then keep all your software up to date, including for your IoT devices and your home routers and some of these things you might not think about. Make sure that you're keeping the software and all those things updated, especially with these Log4j problems that are going on right now. Please, please, please make sure you keep your devices updated, all of them. All right, and that will wrap up my list of news resolutions. There are other things you can do if you want. You can sign up for my newsletter. When you do that, you'll get a little short document with my top five tips that explain a little bit more about uh, how to do those things. I, or, of course, you can get the book itself, which has 170 tips in it with step-by-step -step instructions and pictures. You can go to my website. Uh, there's a resources tab there, which has a lot of stuff. If you search on checklist, you'll probably find my data privacy checklist, which we're going to talk about more when Data Privacy Week comes up here soon. But I encourage you to do these things. And I'll go one step further. If you think you've gotten a handle on a lot of these things already yourself, then help other people to do these things. Put that on your, on your to-do list to help them to get those things done sooner rather than later. And so there you have it. My ideas for your 2022 New Year's cybersecurity and privacy resolutions. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's it. Uh, I've got a couple more things before we go real quick. Uh, first of all, my annual listener survey. Please, please, please fill this out. I would love to get your feedback. I want to make this podcast as good as it can be. I want to make sure that I'm addressing your needs. So you could get to this link two ways. Uh, it's just a Google form you could fill out. And there are several questions. They're not all mandatory. Uh, it shouldn't take too long. A lot of them are just check boxes. But uh, some of them are free form, open format, and I would love for you to type in some responses. And to make it worth your while, I will be giving away some cool stuff. First of all, to find this, go to the show notes. Uh, you can click the link there. Uh, or if you can remember this, you can go to bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y, slash firewalls dash survey dash 2022. Uh, and the F on firewalls is capitalized. All the rest is lower. So again, bit.ly slash firewalls dash survey dash 2022. That will take you there. Uh, I will be collecting these responses till the end of the month, at which point I will pull some names for any of you who wish to enter. And it's it's not mandatory. It, this is, <laughs> I'm a privacy kind of guy. If you don't want to give me an email address to even enter the contest, then don't do it. Everything else is completely anonymous. However, if you would like to win some stuff, uh, there's a place on the survey for you to give me a contact email. And you can give me a junk email as long as you can check it. All I need to do is contact you if you win. So what am I giving away? I'm giving away a few different things. The top prize uh, for one lucky winner will be a signed physical copy of my book. I'm also throw in a copy of the book Privacy is Power, as long as I'm sending you something. And I will throw in a gold challenge coin. I don't know when I'm going to do my next challenge coin promotion, but here is one chance for you to get one if you haven't gotten one already. And then I will also give out some free PDF copies of my book that I can just do by email, which is a lot simpler. And so for four other winners, I will just send you a PDF copy of my book. So hopefully that will give you some incentive. But if nothing else, I really do want to get your feedback. I want to hear what you guys have to say. I would very much appreciate filling these things out. I promise you I will read them all. Uh, at some point, I'll probably give a, a readout here on the show of some of the top things that came through there that I thought were interesting. But I'm going to leave this open until the end of the month. So you've got another few weeks to do that. And I highly encourage you to do it. And if you want to enter the contest, you might even get some free stuff out of it. So uh, real quick, before we go next week, I'm not sure if we're going to have an interview next week or the week after. Data Privacy Week is coming up soon. That'll start on January 24th. But if you recall, it used to be Data Privacy Day. It is now Data Privacy Week, which is great. We, we, we could use a whole week for that. So I will be definitely doing some uh, programming around data privacy here in the next couple of weeks, including a really great interview. I'm just not sure if that interview is going to happen uh, next Monday or the Monday after that. And along with that, I will kind of run through some of my top data privacy tips as well. So there you have it. Welcome to 2022, everybody. Please be extra, extra special careful out there. This Omicron variant is really super contagious. If you can manage it, just, just stay home as much as you can. If you can't, wear those masks and make sure that they're good masks. I saw some really interesting data recently about how cloth masks and even some of those three-ply surgical masks just aren't as effective as a, uh, an N95 mask or a KN95 mask. So if you can, wear those better masks. 
Better yet, just keep social distancing, stay home when you can, avoid parties, at least until this Omicron surge kind of passes, which hopefully, hopefully won't be too much longer. Christmas and New Year's are going to be horrible. We're going to see a huge spike, but I'm really hoping it will taper off uh, in the next few weeks. And it can if we all do our part. If you have not gotten your shots or if you've not gotten your booster, be sure to get those. Encourage other people to do them as well. All right, that'll do it. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Please fill out that feedback survey. I would love to get your input. Stay safe out there. Take care. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge tag.